Good morning, YouTube. Today, I wanna to tell you some more lessons I learned from my failed turtle business. Specifically, I wanna talk about how much each of our cars made, or I guess better said, uh, how much they lost, and how they performed. So are you recording all of the nefarious activities? So if you're new to the channel, my name is Dan, this is my Ferrari, and usually I'm doing content about supercars, we do supercar reviews, we do DIY work on cars, but I recently am kind of winding down my turbo business, I've done a couple of videos on it, and tons of you had questions, actually a lot of accusations that were completely misaligned, so I thought I'd do a little bit more explaining about the situation, because a lot of you seem to enjoy that conversation, and specifically talking about how my turbo business failed. There's a lot of assumptions about what our business goals were, because I did a video talk about how we weren't profitable and of course people lost their minds and said that of course we're idiots and blah 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 and it's really not quite that simple we never really had this intention of making a bunch of money on Turo. That was never the goal. We did want to make some money, but the primary goal was always to have us get some cool luxury cars for free. That was actually kind of what we were trying to accomplish. And we almost sort of were achieving that, but not really. So even then we still weren't quite successful. And basically it's a function of Turo's change to their policies and the situation changed and the marketplace changed and it no longer looked like it was gonna be viable for what we were trying to accomplish. This wasn't a situation where we were trying to get rich or establish some new massive co corporate conglomerate that was gonna be like the end all be all with a fleet of a thousand cars. That just wasn't our goal. At the time it was mostly, hey, can we get some cool cars and have someone else pay for it? It was partially true and it kind of sort of accomplished that, but then all the other stuff like the cars getting damaged, you know, like that roof right there, uh, flying off my Corvette is an example. So those sorts of things kind of made it not so appealing. But let's talk about how our cars performed and what cars we actually had in the system. So to keep it simple, I'm just gonna talk about how everything did last year, so all of 2019. So in 2019, we usually had eight cars at any given moment. We pulled in a little over $45,000 in revenue, so not a bad amount of money, but unfortunately the cars ended up costing us more than $45,000, so we didn't actually make any profit. That's okay, though. So it was a good interesting lesson. So first of all we had a 2017 BMW M3 and this car looks initially like it did really well but as you can see on the graph almost all of its revenue or a substantial chunk of that revenue came from one renter. So we had one guy that rented the car and drove all the way across the state of Texas, almost into Mexico, and then drove all the way back over a course of only three days. So his mileage overcharges were actually well over a thousand dollars. So in that one incident, it pretty much covered quite a bit of the revenue for this car. But otherwise, as you can see, it didn't really rent that much for the rest of the time. Overall, the BMW seemed to perform okay, but not great. And then we also ended up having to have the engine replaced in the M3. So I don't know if that's a function of just poor design or it being a BMW or whatever, but we did have to get a new engine and thank God that car was still under warranty. That was a big problem and one of the things that sucked about owning a BMW. About halfway through the year, one of the guys in the company bought a 2018 Ford Raptor and decided to put that in. It was actually his personal truck, so it wasn't technically one of the company's cars. It only ended up pulling $1,126, so not a whole lot. And of course we had a couple cancellations because unfortunately when it's your personal car, you're trying to balance your need of that car. So he had to cancel sometimes when he was doing business trips or using the car itself or needed it for whatever reason it ended up being uh, not exactly a winner and not that many people were interested in that car so overall if you're trying to do a Ford Raptor I don't think you're gonna make that much money or at least we didn't do very well in our area so maybe it's the Austin market wasn't very appealing for this truck so our most expensive car at least most expensive initially was our 2014 Maserati Quattroporte GTS that car when it was brand new was a hundred and fifty five thousand dollars but we bought it for only $44,000 and it only had 11,000 miles on it. So it was a screaming deal. We got it at wholesale basically. And so we thought maybe, maybe this car would do pretty well. It's an amazing car. It's beautiful. It drives wonderfully. It has an amazing sound to it. This wonderful Ferrari based V8 that's in the car. And unfortunately it still didn't rent very well. It only pulled in $1,834. It was interesting because that car frequently got rented out for weddings or celebrations, but it did not get rented out for business use, which we were 
hoping it would. You'd think that people coming in would want a cool, nice luxury car when they drive around for business things, but it just didn't happen. And so unfortunately it just had very low rents. So we had to keep dropping the price lower and lower and lower and all the way down to like $120 a day. And it still wasn't even renting out. Also, like, this was a very disappointing car for us because we thought it had a good chance. The only other problem was that there just was no other Maserati Quattro Portes at the time in the system. So getting a comparison was not very easy. All the other cars, we had good data suggesting how they would perform. This car, we admit, we kind of gambled and rolled the dice. And unfortunately, we definitely came up craps. Our 2013 Porsche Boxster S actually did pretty decent. It was one of the top performing cars that we had. Also, it was fairly bulletproof. It never really had any sort of things go wrong with it. However, it did have some damage happen that Turo denied the claims on us for because they said it was normal wear and tear. So initially, we started off with the mid-tier insurance plan. When it came back from one of its rentals, it got a dent in the hood that was about that long. And Turo's official policy on wear and tear is if it's not at least two or three inches, I forget which, it's considered normal wear and tear. It looked like someone threw a brick into the car. Clearly something happened and they denied the claim. So we ended up having to have the hood totally repainted and have the dent pounded out and it ended up costing us a couple thousand dollars. So that was out of our pocket. Uh, otherwise the car did pretty well. It pulled in $5,786. So it did pretty decent. It was a pretty consistent, good renting car. Certainly every, every time it was nice weather, people wanted to have the top down and rent that car. So it was pretty fun. I admit, I really enjoyed that car. It was a very fun car. Of course it's a Porsche so it's nearly bulletproof. Unfortunately, it just still didn't even make a profit. So a lot of people commented that we should have bought Teslas and Teslas are the best. So actually, we had a 2013 Tesla Model S. It was a P80 and we got it for a pretty good price and it still had original agreements with Tesla where you get free superchargers. Unfortunately, the thing with Tesla that people forget about is a lot of people have these Teslas on Turo. So a lot of people had the same theory. So there's tons of competition, which means the daily rate for Teslas is terrible. Terrible. You're talking under $100 a day for a car that's nearly $40,000. So you're not really making a good return on the car. The good news is that they don't require a whole lot of maintenance. However, after we shut down the company, like a week or two after we shut down the company, this car's battery died completely. Thank God it was still under warranty, but that was an $18,500 battery. We had to go get that thing swapped out. That is crazy. So those of you thinking that Teslas are bulletproof or whatever, be aware when those things are out of warranty, you could be facing a massive, massive bill if that battery goes to shit. So overall, it pulled in about $4,736 in the year. Still not enough to cover its own ass, but it did do pretty decent. So it was one of the okay performing cars. Something that's really weird is we actually did have a Porsche 911 Carrera S. It was a 997. I don't remember the year. I think it was a 2008. And it actually performed really, really well. It was our, I think, second or third best performing car. But what's fascinating is we removed the car from the system when we sold it and now the car disappeared from Turo's data. So I don't have easy access to how much that car pulled in. But what I can tell you is that it pulled in less than the next two cars I'm going to tell you about. So I don't have the full picture here, but that car was really good. Again, though, we did have some maintenance problems at the end, probably because it was beat on pretty hard. All these people that are like, you guys are idiots. You knew people were going to beat on the cars. Yeah, we did. We expected that to happen, but we also expected that it should be pulling it enough to cover some of those things but eh. so our second best renting car was the corvette right here this 2015 corvette c7 stingray it's actually a manual transmission which we admit was a bit of a gamble almost all of them were automatic transmissions but that was what we hoped would make ours want to be rented more and i think that was a pretty good assumption because ours was consistently rented a lot so this thing rented over 60 times in one year so pretty good numbers of rents unfortunately us uh, the vast majority of those were one day rentals and they're almost always on the weekend so that was annoying in and of itself. The car pulled in about $8,000 in revenue. So this car actually almost came close to being profitable. But again, once you factor in how much the car costs with maintenance and all that stuff, it still was not profitable. However, that roof just got destroyed. And thankfully the renter fully admitted it right away and Turo settled in our favor. Of course, I mean, it was pretty blatantly obvious. And they gave us about $2,400 for the roof. Now I went and looked up the OEM roofs and they were over three and a half thousand dollars to buy them from GM. However, fortunately, because of my YouTube channel, one of my viewers reached out to me and said, hey, I've actually got a C7 roof in Arctic White. It's perfect condition. We never really used it. If you want to buy it from me, I can ship it to you. And so I did. And that came in just 
yesterday. So I have to buy the mounting hardware for it, but all in, I think I'm gonna spend about 1200 bucks on this. So I'm gonna pocket about 1200 bucks from the cost of the roof. And of course that also is factoring in lost rentals because the car is out of commission until I get that roof replaced. So that actually might be the most money we've made on Turo was by having a roof get destroyed. So that's not exactly the business formula you want. You don't want it to be where you're making money because of bad things. That's not a good idea in my opinion. And finally, we had my 2014 Jaguar F-Type S V8 convertible, and it was actually the top running car. So it rented more than any other car. It rented well over 60 times, and it pulled in over $11,000 in one year. But unfortunately, it's a Jaguar, and that means that it broke multiple times. So we had multiple coolant leaks. We actually ended up having where, I, when I sold the car, I believe the head gasket was blowing. I don't know for sure. So it was just a basket case of problems. It had a ton of maintenance. That maintenance cost ended up making it so that we did not make any money on the car whatsoever. So unfortunately, it could have made money, it had a chance, but the maintenance just crushed us. So I still keep having people message me saying, oh man, I'm thinking about doing this, should I do it? You know, one guy was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy an R8, should I do it? I'm like, no, no, no. So here's what I'm telling you, you can try it, I don't think you're gonna make money and I think you're gonna end up really heartbroken when that car gets damaged. Any of you that are thinking about buying a car and then supplementing the cost of the car with Turo rentals, you're gonna have your car get damaged. It happened to literally every single one of our cars. <laughs> So expect that to happen. If that's something you're okay with, then you might be okay. But the problem is that you're not thinking about is every time these cars get damaged, you either have to go get it repaired or accept the damage and just continue on. So most of these damage incidents weren't full on like crashes. They're stupid little things like bumping a post or scraping a door or getting a door ding, something like that. So unless you want your car to constantly, constantly being repaired or constantly getting fixed, I don't think that's a good strategy. You're probably gonna be really disappointed and not enjoy yourself and certainly the risks are really high. So you have this asset that you're relying on this third-party company that could change their opinions or change their policies at any moment. And let's be real, every single policy change they've made so far has been in favor of Turo making more money and that means you're gonna make less money. So it's not exactly a good idea and it's not something I would recommend to anyone. Before you go message me saying, should I do this or I was thinking about doing Turo, my answer is gonna be the same every single time. It's don't do it, just don't do it. It's not worth the effort. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this and hopefully you've enjoyed my failed Turo lessons that I've been able to dispense to you guys. I know a lot of people have been giving me crap. It's interesting to read some of the comments where people are giving me shit about a failed business. You have to fail in life in order to learn lessons. Like if you never fail, it means you never tried something new or experimented or pushed yourself beyond your limits. I highly encourage you to try something that you might have to high probability of failing. That's how you actually advance yourself. Believe me, my entire career has been in software. I have failed so many times. And that is why I'm so comfortable with it. You have to get comfortable with failing and accept that it's okay. And when people give you shit about failing, just ignore them. They haven't experienced enough life to understand that that's actually a very important part of life. And anyone who thinks that they're never gonna fail is sorely mistaken and clearly delusional. Everyone fails, just get over it, learn the lessons, see the value in the failure. Don't just sit here and dwell on, oh, woe is me, I failed. Find out how you can learn and do better and that's how you improve. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe. I do appreciate it greatly when you guys can do that. It does help on my channel and so thank you very much. Also, if you would like that clock right there on the wall, that Ferrari clock, I'm gonna be giving away as soon as I hit 50,000 subscribers, which should be pretty soon. All you have to do is go to my website, normalguysupercar.com, and either sign up for my email list or go buy some of my merch. If you do that, plus like, share, and subscribe, you'll automatically be entered for a chance to win as soon as we hit 50,000 subscribers. So thank you for those of you that are doing that. We got a lot of car stuff coming your way. You're gonna wanna stay tuned. It's gonna be sweet.